the most common hallucinations being of a little girl, she leads me to a hole in the floor where she drags me under. When I come back up, I always try to end it. Psychologists, what are some of the creepiest mental conditions you have ever encountered? The worst thing I've actually encountered in terms of creepy was a little developing sociopath. He had history, fire, animals, sex, and was apparently high in callous and unemotional traits. He was about 11 when I first met him, so no one was going to call him antisocial personality disorder or anything. But that's what he looked like he was growing into. Anyway, the kid is incredibly funny, smart, and charming. No one can believe what his previous school and doctors were saying about him. I was new there, so I was taken in as well. Then, one day he gets in trouble for stealing, and we had the proof on camera, but he didn't know that. I'm sitting in as a witness and security while he's going through this whole series of emotions, surprise, indignation, fear, anger, etc. as he pretends he has no idea why he's being accused. Then we show the tape and he just stops dead, blank expression, and says something to the effect of, so what, you were just wasting my time. It was another voice, a completely different personality coming out of this kid, like you flipped a switch. I've seen some things, but that moment was creepy as hell. I'm not a psychologist, but I was in a mental institution for attempt suicide. Lots of bad things had happened to lead me to that choice. Please don't judge. But, as I was saying, there was this girl there, named Anna, and she would comb her hair in the morning and talk to herself. Sometimes she would start to violently scream at herself. One time she grabbed her hair as if it wasn't her pulling it, and forcefully bashed her head repeatedly into the mirror screaming, love me, love me. And at night she would start to play with herself and scream her father's name. I have never been so scared in my life. This girl Anna, was only 15. Her father would rape, and abuse her. The mother was beaten also. I never want to relive that ever again. I was in a psych ward for depression, and my roommate was terrifying. She was schizophrenic, depressed, and also probably just weird. She punched herself in the face constantly, while whispering to the voices in her head. She also used to sit in the multi-purpose room, TV, games, fridge, etc., on the floor and masturbated. Like, a lot. But she never stopped whispering to herself while she did it. I woke up to pee one night, and she was just in her bed, staring blankly at me. She was moved to a long-term facility on my third day there. Not a professional, but a friend of mine is suffering the Cap Gras delusion. We moved apart several years ago and hadn't been in touch very well. I knew she had gone through some stressful times. I had a couple of phone calls with her where she was worried that her computer had been hacked, but she seemed reasonable. Then one day she called me and told me that her husband had been replaced with an imposter. She wanted me to fly to visit her so I could see him with my own eyes and confirm for her that it wasn't really him. Talking to her is simultaneously fascinating, unnerving, and heartbreaking. The worst part is, while she is clearly not correct in her beliefs, she is quite consistent in them and they are utterly real in her mind. Imagine how terrified you would be all the time if you were certain that the most important person in your life was a stranger, with mysterious nefarious motivations? Imagine going to bed every night next to someone you thought was out to get you. Imagine spending all day desperately trying to find your husband because he must be out there somewhere, right? Nobody's been diagnosed with this in 40 odd years or so, but it's still taught in most undergrad courses because it's a really good example of a culture specific disorder. It's called Wendigo Psychosis, or Wendigo, Wedico, or Winico, and here's how it goes down. You're a young male in an Algonquin tribe. It's been a long, cold winter, and your whole tribe is starving. You and your hunting partner have been out hunting for moose or deer or even a bear if you have two, but you've totally struck out. You're starving. He's starving. And you've seen the way he's starting to look at you over the fire at night. So you do what you have to do before he does. You kill him and eat him. You know what happens when you eat another man, but you're starving and it's cannibalize or die. So you eat him. And the Wendigo comes and possesses you, because the Wendigo possesses everyone who eats someone else. And now that the Wendigo has possessed you, you're hungrier than you were? Hungrier than you've ever been before. But the only thing you're hungry for is more people. So you back to your tribe and one of two things happen. First, you tell someone, and they attempt to cure you by having you eat melted bear fat until you vomit the heart of ice you now have, because you are a Wendigo demon, 35% of reported cases were cured by this method. Second, you don't tell anyone, got back to your tribe, and attempt to kill and eat a family member. 
you will eventually be stopped and killed during your murder cannibalism rampage, and your remaining family members will burn your body and scatter the ashes to prevent the Wendigo from possessing them too, the other 65% of reported cases. Cap Gras Delusion The Cap Gras Delusion is usually a symptom of paranoid schizophrenia, which seems all kinds of horrifying. Basically, a person with this delusion becomes convinced that a loved one or close friend has been replaced by an identical imposter. They'll acknowledge that the person looks the same, but they are convinced that it is someone else, like a robot, or something other strange. I seem to remember learning about a case where a person ended up killing and cutting open their father's head to prove he was a robot. Paranoid schizophrenia in general it seems like it would definitely be the most disturbing disorder to personally experience. Most people take for granted that what they see and experience is real, but imagine not being able to trust anything you experience or think. I am a paranoid schizophrenic. I don't believe there is anything scarier on the planet than an episode. Nothing is more terrifying than being betrayed by your own mind. The things you hear and see. It's awful. I will always remember my first episodes because they are haunting enough to stick with me till this day. I was 12 or 13 years old and I was laying in bed trying to sleep, but I was uncomfortable and couldn't get myself to doze off. As I'm laying there a shadow moves across my vision, instinctively I turn to look at it. The dark figure comes closer and sits at the end of my bed, thankfully at this age I did not see a face, it was a woman entirely in black, she sat and she watched me for the entire night, the entire time whispering to me. They hate you no one loves you, kill them, the kitchen, the knives, daddy's gun, end it, you can't run, I will find you. Something tells me I should have screamed for my mother or father. For help, but I couldn't. I believed what it told me. But I did not do what it said. I have triggers now that I've noticed. For me basements are the root of evil in my head. The most common hallucinations being of a little girl, she leads me to a hole in the floor where she drags me under. When I come back up, I always try to end it. My worst episode occurred when I was in a Walmart. I made a huge scene and I had to be taken away by ambulance actually. I had been shopping for something for dinner when all of a sudden everyone I saw around me turned and looked at me. They gathered circling around me, I couldn't break through. They were telling me to kill myself. I remember waking up in a hospital after that. My mother tells me I dropped in the floor and started screaming and clawing at my wrists. A lot of people know about phantom limb syndrome, in which someone continues to feel as if their limb is still there after it has been amputated, often in great pain. Another interesting one that not many people know about and is almost kind of an opposite is body integrity identity disorder, which is when a person has extremely strong feelings that one or more of their limbs does not belong to them, despite being functional, and often they really really want to amputate. From their descriptions, it seems that it is actually very psychologically painful, sometimes to the point that they will self-amputate because no doctor is willing to amputate a healthy limb. Reactive Attachment Disorder I worked at a group home for kids with this disorder and it was creepy before I fully understood it. Children who have suffered severe abuse and neglect early in life often have their ability to form healthy attachments to caregivers, or anyone, destroyed. Some of them would cling to me, call me mommy, and beg to come home with me 30 seconds after I met them. Others would refuse to talk to anyone, hurt themselves, and others set fires and act out any chance they could. Sometimes they would improve enough to be sent to foster homes only to have their behavior come back worse once they were placed in an unstructured family setting. Fatal familial insomnia is pretty scary. Suddenly, you just start not being able to fall asleep, and you're gone within 7 to 36 months. You gradually lose the ability, along with a number of other symptoms over time, until it eventually, at the end of the last stage, you'll have not slept in a long time, will have been hallucinating and suffering from dementia, and eventually die. Only 40 families, about 100 people, have the disorder. Also, if you have it, there's a good chance you'll have kids by its onset, making the disorder pass down ever further. Scary stuff. I'm neither a psych major or a psychologist, however I did spend a week in a mental ward. I had depression, I told the cop I wanted to kill myself in a fit of rage, etc etc, the hospital I was at was divided. One side was group A, folks who needed treatment but were considered safe. Group B was the folks that had to be watched a lot more closely. About two days after I was checked in, another woman had come in too. She was placed in group A, and was placed as my roommate. At first she seemed nice and normalish, but after a few hours, her stories were getting mixed up. I mean, she came in, found out I had a kid, then said she had a daughter as well who lived with her mother-in-law or something. 
After dinner, the story was her daughter had been brutally murdered by her father and that the woman didn't even care. I voiced my concerns to the nurses, but was told to just go to bed, in the same room with her. It took a while for me to fall asleep that night because my sleep schedule was all sorts of messed up. I think I passed out around midnight, we were put to bed at 8 pm, I'm not sure how long I was asleep for before I was woken up to my roommate strangling me. Now, we were placed in the last room at the end of the hall. Far from the nurse's desk. Plus I was being strangled, so I couldn't even yell for help. I thought I was going to die, but I had fallen asleep with a book. So I bashed the book on my roommate's head and booked it out of the room. The nurses probably thought I was the super crazy one, yelling at them. I'm not sure they would have believed me if it wasn't for the fact I had hand marks around my neck. My roommate was transferred to the other side of the ward, locked up with limited time out of her room. I never bothered to ask what her deal was. I didn't want to know. I had a new roommate by the end of the day. A really nice older lady who was a lesbian. I told her about crazy roommate number one and we would just shoot the poop for hours at night until I was ready to pass out. I'm a psych major, so not a professional, but in my opinion it is catatonic schizophrenia. Those suffering from this type of schizophrenia, although in the DSMV they are getting rid of the different types of schizophrenia, there will just be one classification, will sometimes be unable to speak or move. My professor worked in a clinic while in school and told us of one patient who would suddenly lock up into extremely awkward position and not move for extended periods of time. Wife is a psychologist. She says shared delusional disorder. Woman and her mother had paranoid delusions about mom's ex-husband, and were convinced he was stalking them and breaking into their house. The ex had gotten the woman's son, age 6, a modeling contract, and they thought that every picture of a kid in a magazine was him. The images that didn't look like him they claimed were photoshopped. This was so weird and creepy since two people shared the same delusions. Split brain syndrome. Sometimes as a means of treating severe seizures slash epilepsy, surgeons will sever the corpus callosum, the connecting tissue between the two lobes of the brain. The good news is that future full-blown seizures are limited to one half of the brain, leaving the patient aware and able to take precautionary measures. The bad news is that, Thanks to the lateralization of function, there are essentially two minds in the skull that can each only react to certain forms of stimuli. Patients usually develop workarounds, though. The weirdest part is the occasional outcome of alien hand syndrome, in which one of the brains takes control of one hand and uses it independently. When questions are presented to the controlling hemisphere, the hand can write out its answers, which are sometimes in disagreement with the main brain and the patient's spoken answers. It's been a while since I've studied abnormal psych so the details might be a little fuzzy. Hey there, I'm a therapist. Because I respect the confidentiality of my clients, I won't tell any of the interesting stories about them. As most people will tell you, psychotic disorders, or symptoms, and personality disorders tend to be the most shocking or unsettling. I've worked with violent sex offenders, including minors, ASPD clients, layman's terms, sociopaths or psychopaths, borderline clients, schizotypal clients, and addicts along with the more run-of-the-mill clients. Personally, I've never been rattled by them, but that's part of why I went into psychology. Instead of being scared by the bizarre, I tend to be made curious. Instead I'll give some general information about some of the more bizarre disorders out there. My favorite bizarre psychological phenomena to bring up in this type of conversation is the culture-bound syndrome of Koro. It occurs in Asian cultures and is typified by an irrational fear of the penis receding into the body, causing harm. It is most common in men, and seems to be associated with feelings of sexual guilt or shame. In extreme cases, people have been known to mutilate their own genitals in attempts to keep them from going up inside their body, like grabbing their penis with the pliers. Another one is brain fag, I know, weird name, which tends to affect primarily high-stress students in African countries. Basically, it's a somatic blindness brought on by reading or studying too much. Pica is a disorder where people have an uncontrollable hunger for unusual items like clay, chalk, hair, paint chips, etc. I've read about extremely bad cases of hair pica where people have to have surgery to remove enormous hairballs from their stomach, as it is not properly digested. Obviously, eating other inorganic things can have serious health repercussions. Glove paralysis is another pretty interesting somatic disorder, in which the person can't feel or move their hands from the wrist down. Because of how your nerves are arranged in your arm slash hand, there is no way that it could be caused by actual nerve damage. Basically, 
there are two separate nerves that feed into the bottom half of your arm, pinky side, as well as your pinky and ring fingers. The other provides neurological impulses to the top, thumb side, and your thumb, index, and middle fingers. There also exist a variety of interesting effects that can result because of damage to various areas of the brain. Aphasias, damage to the speech centers of the brain, can result in a variety of disorders of speech and speech recognition. Here's an example of Veronica's aphasia, in which the sufferer can understand what the tester is saying, but cannot reproduce it. I've worked with some TBI clients who have serious communication issues because of their brain injury, which makes progress very challenging. When there is an underlying, organic cause to the disorder, it is very difficult to address it with talk therapy alone. It's always interesting to me how different psychopathology can be in different cultures. Some disorders with a strong biological component, like schizophrenia, seem to occur across the world at the same rate. Others, like eating disorders, simply do not occur with any regularity in other cultures. Thanks for listening to Radio TTS. Hit the subscribe button to become part of the Ice Cream Sandwich community. Hit the bell notification for updates on new videos. And let me know in the comments if you know any other mental conditions that weren't listed in the video.